Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming here. I am so very honored to be here. And Jim, Jim Pa, and all my other wonderful colleagues at Stanford Sea Care, I'm, and the folks at Telluride for hosting this glorious, delightful, complicated, rich, auspicious event that we'll call the Compassion Science Gathering. And um, so thank you for inviting me, and I'm honored that you all came. I am here at this meeting in a dual capacity. I am both a teacher of meditation, and my work through Sea Care is primarily in that capacity. I'm one of the senior teachers of the Compassion Training Pro Protocol, and I've had the you know, honor of working on that. I've also been teaching um, meditation for many, many years prior to that involvement. And um, I'm also a scientist who studies emotion. For years, I primarily studied emotion and facial expression, and about 12 years ago, was able to bring my scientific research and my practice together. And I feel very fortunate to be alive and working at this time when these worlds are meeting. And um, part of that uh, meeting of worlds for me has offered me this rich opportunity to have both the science inform my teaching and the teaching and practice of meditation inform my science. So when I think about the measurement of compassion, it really is informed by both of those perspectives and worldviews as well as my lived experience. So that's what I'm going to give you by means of background. And my scientific work is primarily these days at UC Davis at the Center for Mind and Brain, um, where I work with my colleague Cliff Saren, who's in the audience, and a number of wonderful other scientists. And we'll, we'll talk about that research momentarily. So what I want to put to you is um, a framework that's come from my dual perspective. When you talk about measuring compassion, I'm um, totally with Bob. This is a tough tough cookie, tough nut to crack, and as a, you know, a practitioner and teacher of meditation, compassion is one of those things that's called an immeasurable. It's one of the four immeasurable qualities. Now, it's called immeasurable for, two, for probably many reasons, but to simplify it into two reasons, one is that it's boundless. It has no limits. Compassion is endless. That's why when we talk about things like compassion, burnout, or fatigue, it doesn't really make sense because it's generative and um, re nourishing and rewarding. But it is also, I think, immeasurable in that it's difficult to touch. And when you come to it as a scientist, it's a very difficult problem about how to make sense of it. So I'm going to put to you how I've made sense of it and how we've worked with it, particularly, I think, in the Shamata Project at UC Davis, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. I think first it's useful to see where I'm coming from in terms of defining compassion. I think this is the first time I've put up a slide where I'm telling you this is what I think rather than what I'm um, borrowing from all the people I've worked with. I am taking it in a very active way. I'm not trying to call it a thing, but more of when you're compassionate. You see others in their full predicament, and this speaks to really being present with wherever they are be it lovely and beautiful and happy, or suffering or miserable, or bored, seeing where they are, feeling connected to that experience. And this is actually one of the places where we, when we're working with compassion training, it's an essential element of training to really resonate with the state, both bodily and in, in, in mind and perspective, to know where they're coming from. That might be the empathic element. But feeling connected, that they are also like you, and because of that connection and understanding of the human pr predicament and how it feels to be um, suffering and in pain or not, uh, wishing that they be free from suffering or pain, that they be well and happy. So if they are in that predicament of being well and happy, wishing that that continue. If they're suffering, in, and the suffering, you know, I don't know if we've made a place in this meeting, and perhaps we can do this off the stage of talking about suffering, but I think that's a really interesting point. We often think of it if you see someone bleeding or someone, um, you know, dying or someone in mental distress, but there's all kinds of suffering. The suffering of being a miserable SOB. That's suffering, right? There's a lot of suffering behind that. So it takes all these, in fact, some of our greatest teachers are the people who are most difficult for us to face in life. 
And then in witnessing all that and being with that and feeling connected to all that, there's a key motivational component. And Dan, I look forward to talking to you more about this. Being motivated to help them find relief from the suffering or to continue to flourish. So that's sort of where I'm coming from. I've also been very, very um, moved and um, influenced by this model of my dear friend and teacher, Joan Halifax. And I think Cliff Saren, if you were here on um, the other day, presented her, her model in some detail. And I'm not going to do that in detail. But what, what Joan does is she talks about com compassion as an emergent process. And this really resonated with me because in this thing that seems so complex, that has emotional aspects, it has um, perceptual attentive as aspects, it has bodily aspects, but it feels so hard to measure directly. So it emerges from all these sub-elements listed here. But what she maintains is that it's not directly trainable. I'm not necessarily, I, I have to think about how I feel about that, but I do realize that when we're training in compassion, we do send to, to supportive elements, so there's something to that. But as a scientist, when I heard that, it really hit me because I, I've been feeling for a long time that it's so hard to measure because maybe we cannot touch it directly but maybe we can approximate it. So approximating compassion is the point of view I'm going to be advocating here. Not that we might find the golden rod or measure of compassion someday, but from where we are right now and from my thinking about this, we can come at it from so many different angles, approximate it, multiple indicators. And, um, my emphasis has been looking at what, if you are someone who's compassionate, what would that look like emotionally? M not meaning what does the emotion of compassion look like. That might be one way of casting that net at a different level, at a more emergent level. But really, if you've developed compassion, when presented with provocation, what might we expect to see in terms of the emotional response? That's a testable question. And that's what, something that we might call empirically tractable. So let, let me take you now into a little detail on studying emotion in the laboratory. I took to heart this measurement title of this workshop, so I really want to talk about measuring. So the first thing that you need to, to look to if you're going to measure emotion in the laboratory is you have to create emotion in the laboratory. Now, I'm, I'm not saying this can only be done in the laboratory. There are many, many rich contexts. In fact, I was already spinning my wheels on how to do it in one of these situations that Bob was talking about. There are wonderful ways for ambulatory measurement and real-life interactions, but I'm taking it down to um, uh, an a level in which we can have more experimental control, especially when you are in the earlier stages of measuring something that hasn't had as much measurement, you want to be sure you're, you're measuring what you think you're measuring. So I'm just talking about laboratory research on emotion. There's, there's naturally occurring context. There's interview context that you can do in the laboratory. But in the laboratory, if you want to elicit, get someone to feel emotional so that you can study them, you have to present them with some sort of provocation. You can play sounds. In fact, there is um, some fascinating work that Richie Davidson and Antoine Lutz, Lutz did with um, meditation adepts, where they listened to sounds of babies crying. Um, and they were looking at the effect of compassion meditation on response to that kind of suffering. So you can play emotionally evocative sounds. You can show emotionally evocative films or pictures. This is an image um, that's taken from the IAPS slide set. It's a very well-known um, emotional stimulus slide set. Um, this is clearly um, someone who is suffering here. So that's something that might be a good stimulus for a compassion and emotion study. Films are nice because they're more dynamic. You can depict a, a range of things happening, and it, it, they have a tendency to draw people in a little bit more than pictures. And if you study nonverbal behavior like I do, films are much better at eliciting facial behavior than, than pictures are. And then there are also tasks, the stories you can present to people. Um, and I think now I'm going to go back to the teaching in teaching our compassion training class. Some of the most 
powerful tools that we use in there are reading stories of people in real life situations who helped pe others in need. So there, there are ways to be very, very evocative that way. And, and tasks, which I'll set aside for now. So let's you, you get people in the laboratory, you can make them emotional. And there's a long, well, 40 year history of studying emotion carefully in the laboratory from which you can draw. And there are a lot of complicated um, issues that I don't have the time to get into detail about right now. So let's say you create emotion in the laboratory. How do you go about measuring it? And this is just quickly to review because I want to get into more detail on what we've done in Shamata Project. But emotions, they're very complex too. They have m many facets to them. They have subjective feeling states. There's physiological changes in the body. There are expressive changes, other behavioral changes, thoughts, images, because they're so complex. To get a best, the clearest picture of what's happening, you need, you need multiple measures, such as behavior. Now there's overt actions, such as the kind that Bob was mentioning. Then there's expressive behavior, such as the kind we can see on the face. And um, this, is a, this is actually Paul Ekman, the guy who was talking to you yesterday morning. This is Paul Ekman in about 1974 in one of his training pictures from the facial action coding system. And this was, you know, pre-Photoshop. This, this was like black and white glossies and they drew on them. They probably didn't even have Sharpies. I don't know what they used. Um, but here in this picture, you're seeing some of the elements of the facial action coding system, which is an anatomically based system for exhaustively coding all observable facial actions. And this is just one image pulled out of the manual where you're seeing a number of the lower face actions, such as um, action unit nine, which pulls the nose up in disgust, as I'm doing here. Action unit 15, which brings the, can you see my face? Brings the lip corners down. Forgot to arrange for the camera. Face close up. Five minutes, okay, enough of that. Um, but this, this, is, this is facts, okay. Um, and physiology, and we have some little cute images that my, oh, for previous concert, my friend Terry helped me find on the internet. Here's our little model with the physiology hookup, you know, whatever. And you can fill out a questionnaire, all right, okay. Now, what we did in the Shamata Project, and for those of you, I mentioned it briefly yesterday in re response to one of Jim's discussion questions, but Shamata Project was this m massive effort, um, an experimental study of the effects of intensive meditation training on a number of different kinds of um, outcome measures, such as attentional performance, emotion regulation, um, a number of physiological parameters. People had three months of intensive training. I want to just look at one piece where we looked at the laboratory research to look at measures of resp emotional responses to suffering, because we're trying to look at whether there's been a growth in compassion over the course of the three-month training. And um, I'm going to jump ahead and just say, what did we do in this film recall task? First of all, if you're testing compassion, you should put forth the you know, eliciter of compassion, which is Suffering, right? So suffering, scenes of suffering. How can you create a laboratory situation where suffering can look authentic? We drew on the rich history of using film stimuli in emotion research. We picked documentary film footage. We found from piloting that people were most responsive to things that looked real, that they didn't feel like they were being manipulated by um, a Hollywood scene. And, um, and in particular, this the scene that I'm going to focus on today was in our post-test. We did pre- and post-test. I have zero seconds? Oh, three. Okay. <laughs> I thought it went from five to zero. Okay. And you see, I did notice you. I was afraid I wouldn't notice you. Um, we actually have a film clip that depicted scenes from the Iraq War, both um, the interviews with the soldiers talking about going into battle and getting it all stoked up for the battle, which is difficult for people to watch because it's like, these very young, naive guys talking about war as if it's a video game. And then you see the battle and the consequences of their actions and some rather um, gruesome images. And then you see soldiers expressing their regret. So it's a, it's a lot of kinds of suffering there. It's, it's, it's the arrogance of the naive young soldier. It's the, um, the horror of war. 
and then it's the regret and the misery experienced by being involved in that. What kind of things will we predict in response to the, that kind of provocation? We would expect more sadness. Sadness as, and I'm looking at facial expressions of sadness here. Sadness as a sign of being moved and upset by what they see. We also expected what we called fewer emotions of rejection. And this is a term that um, we adopted as sort of a, a rubric to encompass a core set of affects, anger, contempt, and disgust, that share this quality of really separating self and other. Contempt and disgust by being utterly, dis you know, contempt is utterly dismissive. The more I think about it, I think that is the antithesis of compassion more than anything else. You have dismissed somebody else as worthy of your attention because they've done something reprehensible or you've, you've had it. Disgust, there's a repulsion, a physical revulsion. And anger is not as much a dismissal, but it's, it is supported by me versus you. So there's that separation. Okay. So more touched by suffering, less repulse. So this is one, this what you see here, I obviously don't have time to show you the film. This is one of our participants, and this is a scene that she is seeing. We exhaustively coded all her facial actions during this very, like, three-minute um, film viewing period. We also got multiple measures of um, physiology and self-report. I am not going to show you all this detail about using facts, because I don't have time. But I will say that after this exhaustive coding with these numeric muscular designations, which takes about two hours to score a few minutes of video, this is, this is diff incredibly difficult. And I have great gratitude to, to Tony Zanesco and Brandon King for their amazing gifts in doing this. And then we submit it to a program for emotion interpretations, which I can tell you more about. We also got very detailed subjective ratings here using a visual guide that I don't have time to describe. Let me tell you what I found. Compared to controls, people who underwent intensive meditation training were more likely to show sadness on their face. They were less likely to show the rejection emotions, as we predicted. What's also interesting is the, the information that we got from self-report. We had very detailed ratings of their experience using that visual guide, which I th shouldn't have even shown you in that brief period of time. But what was fascinating to me was um, sympathy measurement, not sadness, really seemed to be the most discriminating subjective rating. The, more they the higher ratings of sympathy they reported, the more sadness they showed. Sadness was not related to experiences of sadness. So I say sadness faces. It was not related to experiences of distress. It was related to experiences of sympathy. And what was really cool is the more sympathy, the less rejection. So I will just cut to the chase and say that what we might be seeing here, I don't know if this is a facial pattern of, a, of um, compassion, but we're seeing an emotional patterning that might reflect a kind of engagement that's consistent with compassion. Empathic responding, evidenced by more sadness displays, and reductions in the amount of pulling back or pushing others away. So taken together, I think we see a pattern of engagement that is indicative of compassion. So that we're using the tools that we have for emotion measurement to start piecing together this puzzle. And this might be one way in which a compassion looks, one way it looks emotionally. We don't know yet if we have a unique signal. I'm not arguing for a unique signal like we would have for a basic emotion. But other emotional signals can be useful and used empirically to tell us that compassion is operating. Thank you.